Pseudoarchaeology also known as alternative archaeology, fringe archaeology, fantastic archaeology, or cult archaeology refers to interpretations of the past from outside of the archaeological science community, which reject the accepted data gathering and analytical methods of the discipline. These pseudoscientific interpretations involve the use of artifacts, sites or materials to construct scientifically insubstantial theories to supplement the pseudoarchaeologists' claims. Methods include exaggeration of evidence, dramatic or romanticized conclusions, use of fallacy, and fabrication of evidence. There is no unified pseudo-archaeological theory or approach, but rather many different interpretations of the past that are jointly at odds with those developed by the scientific community. These include religious approaches such as creationism when identified as creation science. That applies to the archaeology of historic periods such as those that would have included the Tower of Babel, Noah's Ark, and the supposed worldwide flood myth. Some pseudo-archaeological theories revolve around the idea that prehistoric and ancient human societies were aided in their development by intelligent extraterrestrial life, an idea propagated by those such as Italian author Peter Colosimo, French authors Louis Powells and Jacques Bergier in The Morning of the Magicians 1963, and Swiss author Eric von Daniken in Chariots of the Gods. 1968 Others instead hold that there were human societies in the ancient period that were significantly technologically advanced, such as Atlantis, and this idea has been propagated by figures like Graham Hancock in his Fingerprints of the Gods 1995. Pseudo-archaeology has also been manifest in Mayanism and the 2012 phenomenon. Many alternative archaeologies have been adopted by religious groups. Fringe archaeological ideas such as archaeocryptography and pyramidology have been embraced by religions ranging from the British Israelites to the Theosophists. Other alternative archaeologies include those that have been adopted by members of New Age and contemporary pagan belief systems. Academic archaeologists have heavily criticized pseudo-archaeology, with one of the most vocal critics, John R. Cole, characterizing it as relying on sensationalism, misuse of logic and evidence, misunderstanding of scientific method, and internal contradictions in their arguments." The relationship between alternative and academic archaeologies has been compared to the relationship between intelligent design theories and evolutionary biology by some archaeologists. etymology. <inaudible> <inaudible> Various different terms have been employed to refer to these non-academic interpretations of archaeology. During the 1980s, the term, cult archaeology, was used by figures like John R. Cole 1980 and William H. Stebing, Jr. 1987. In the 2000s, the term, alternative archaeology, began to be instead applied by academics like Tim Sebastian 2001, Robert J. Wallace 2003, Cornelius Holtorf 2006, and Gabriel Mashenka 2008. Garrett F. Fagan and Kenneth Fader 2006, however claimed this term was only chosen because it imparts a warmer, fuzzier feel that appeals to our higher ideals and progressive inclinations. They argued that the term, pseudo-archaeology, was far more appropriate, a term also used by other prominent academic and professional archaeologists such as Colin Renfrew 2006. Other academic archaeologists have chosen to use other terms to refer to these interpretations. Glyn Daniel, the editor of Antiquity, used the derogative, bullshit archaeology. And similarly the academic William H. Stebing Jr. noted that there were certain terms used for pseudo-archaeology that were heard in the privacy of professional archaeologists' homes and offices but which cannot be mentioned in polite society. Topic. Characteristics William H. Stebing Jr. argued that despite their many differences, there were a set of core characteristics that almost all pseudo-archaeological interpretations shared. He believed that because of this, pseudo-archaeology could be categorized as a single phenomenon. 
He went on to identify three core commonalities of pseudo-archaeological theories, the unscientific nature of its method and evidence, its history of providing simple, compact answers to complex, difficult issues, and its tendency to present itself as being persecuted by the archaeological establishment, accompanied by an ambivalent attitude towards the scientific ethos of the Enlightenment. This idea that there are core characteristics of pseudo-archaeologies is shared by other academics. Topic. Lack of scientific method Academic critics have pointed out that pseudo-archaeologists typically neglect to use the scientific method. Instead of testing the evidence to see what hypotheses it fits, pseudo-archaeologists press gang the archaeological data to fit a favored conclusion that is often arrived at through hunches intuition or religious or nationalist dogma different pseudo archaeological groups hold a variety of basic assumptions which are typically unscientific the nazi pseudo archaeologists for instance took the cultural superiority of the ancient aryan race as a basic assumption whilst christian fundamentalist pseudo archaeologists conceive of the earth as being less than 10000 years old and hindu fundamentalist pseudo archaeologists believe that the homo sapiens species is much older than the 200000 years old it has been shown to be by archaeologists Despite this, many of pseudo-archaeology's proponents claim that they reached their conclusions using scientific techniques and methods, even when it is demonstrable that they have not. Academic archaeologist John Arcole believed that most pseudo-archaeologists do not understand how scientific investigation works, and that they instead believe it to be a simple, catastrophic right versus wrong battle between contesting theories. It was because of this failure to understand the scientific method, he argued, that the entire pseudo-archaeological approach to their arguments was faulty. He went on to argue that most pseudo-archaeologists do not consider alternative explanations to that which they want to propagate, and that the theories were typically just notions, not having sufficient supporting evidence to allow them to be considered theories. In the scientific, academic meaning of the word, commonly lacking scientific evidence, pseudo-archaeologists typically use other forms of evidence to support their arguments. For instance, they often make use of generalized cultural comparisons, taking various artifacts and monuments from one society, and highlighting similarities with those of another to support a conclusion that both had a common source, typically an ancient lost civilization like Atlantis, Mu, or an extraterrestrial influence. This takes the different artifacts or monuments entirely out of their original contexts, something which is anathema to academic archaeologists, for whom context is of the utmost importance. Another form of evidence used by a number of pseudo-archaeologists is the interpretation of various myths as reflecting historical events, but in doing so these myths are often taken out of their cultural contexts. For instance, pseudo-archaeologist Emanuel Velikovsky claimed that the myths of migrations and war gods in the Central American Aztec civilization represented a cosmic catastrophe that occurred in the 7th and 8th centuries BCE. This was criticized by academic archaeologist William H. Stebing, Jr., who noted that such myths only developed in the 12th to the 14th centuries CE, over a millennium after Velikovsky claimed that the events had occurred, and that the Aztec society itself had not even developed by the 7th century BCE. <laughs> Opposition to the archaeological establishment Pseudo-archaeologists typically present themselves as being underdogs facing the much larger archaeological establishment. They often use language which disparages academics and dismisses them as being unadventurous, spending all their time in dusty libraries and refusing to challenge the orthodoxies of the establishment lest they lose their jobs. In some more extreme examples, pseudo-archaeologists have accused academic archaeologists of being members of a widespread conspiracy to hide the truth about history from the public. 
When academics challenge pseudoarchaeologists and criticize their theories, many pseudoarchaeologists see it as further evidence that their own ideas are right, and that they are simply being suppressed by members of this academic conspiracy. The prominent English archaeologist Colin Renfrew admitted that the archaeological establishment was often set in its ways and resistant to radical new ideas, but that this was not the reason why pseudoarchaeological theories were outright rejected by academics. Garrett G. Fagan expanded on this, noting how in the academic archaeological community, "...new evidence or arguments have to be thoroughly scrutinized to secure their validity and long-standing, well-entrenched positions will take considerable effort and particularly compelling data to overturn." Fagan noted that pseudo-archaeological theories simply do not have sufficient evidence to back them up and allow them to be accepted by professional archaeologists. Conversely, many pseudo-archaeologists, whilst criticizing the academic archaeological establishment, also attempt to get support from people with academic credentials and affiliations. At times, they quote historical, and in most cases dead academics to back up their arguments, for instance prominent pseudo-archaeologist Graham Hancock, in his seminal Fingerprints of the Gods 1995, repeatedly notes that the eminent physicist Albert Einstein once commented positively on the pole shift hypothesis, a theory that has been abandoned by the academic community but which Hancock supports. As Fagan noted however, the fact that Einstein was a physicist and not a geologist is not even mentioned by Hancock, nor is the fact that the understanding of plate tectonics which came to disprove Earth crustal displacement only came to light following Einstein's death. <laughs> <laughs> Nationalist motivations Pseudo-archaeology can be motivated by nationalism cf. Nazi archaeology, using cultural superiority of the ancient Aryan race as a basic assumption to establish the Germanic people as the descendants of the original Aryan master race or a desire to prove a particular religious cf. intelligent design, pseudo-historical, political, or anthropological theory. In many cases, an a priori conclusion is established, and fieldwork is undertaken explicitly to corroborate the theory in detail. Archaeologists distinguish their research from pseudoarchaeology by pointing to differences in research methodology, including recursive methods, falsifiable theories, peer review, and a generally systematic approach to collecting data. Though there is overwhelming evidence of cultural connections informing folk traditions about the past, objective analysis of folk archaeology in anthropological terms of their cultural contexts and the cultural needs they respond to have been comparatively few. However, in this vein, Robert Silverberg located the Mormons' use of mound builder culture within a larger cultural nexus and the voyage of Maddock and Welsh Indians was set in its changing and evolving socio-historical contexts by Gwynne Williams. <inaudible> <inaudible> Religious motivations Religiously motivated pseudo-archaeological theories include the young earth theory of some Judeo-Christian fundamentalists. They argue that the Earth is 4,000 to 10,000 years old, with figures varying, depending on the source. Some Hindu pseudo-archaeologists believe that the Homo sapiens species is much older than the 200,000 years it is generally believed to have existed. Archaeologist John R. Cole refers to such beliefs as cult archaeology and believes them to be pseudo-archaeological. He went on to say that this pseudo-archaeology had many of the attributes, causes, and effects of religion. A more specific example of religious pseudo-archaeology is the claim of Ron Wyatt to have discovered Noah's Ark, the graves of Noah and his wife, the location of Sodom and Gomorrah, the Tower of Babel, and numerous other important sites. However, he has not presented evidence sufficient to impress Bible scholars, scientists, and historians. Answers in Genesis propagates many pseudoscientific notions as part of its creationist ministry. Topic: Description. Pseudoarchaeology can be practiced intentionally or unintentionally. 
Archaeological frauds and hoaxes are considered intentional pseudoarchaeology. Genuine archaeological finds may be unintentionally converted to pseudoarchaeology through unscientific interpretation. CF confirmation bias Especially in the past, but also in the present, pseudoarchaeology has been motivated by racism, especially when the basic intent was to discount or deny the abilities of non-white peoples to make significant accomplishments in astronomy, architecture, sophisticated technology, ancient writing, seafaring, and other accomplishments generally identified as evidence of civilization. Racism can be implied by attempts to attribute ancient sites and artifacts to lost tribes, pre-Columbian trans-oceanic contact, or even extraterrestrial intelligence rather than to the intelligence and ingenuity of indigenous peoples. Practitioners of pseudoarchaeology often rail against academic archaeologists and established scientific methods, claiming that conventional science has overlooked critical evidence. Conspiracy theories may be invoked, in which the establishment colludes in suppressing evidence. Countering the misleading discoveries of pseudoarchaeology binds academic archaeologists in a quandary, described by Cornelius Holtorf as whether to strive to disprove alternative approaches in a crusading approach or to concentrate on better public understanding of the sciences involved, Holtorf suggested a third, relativist and contextualized approach, in identifying the social and cultural needs that both scientific and alternative archaeologies address and in identifying the engagement with the material remains of the past in the present in terms of critical understanding and dialogue with multiple pasts, such as Barbara Bender explored for Stonehenge. In presenting the quest for truths as process rather than results, Holtorf quoted Gotthold Lessing Ina Duplik, 1778, If God were to hold in his right hand all the truth and in his left the unique ever active spur for truth, although with the corollary to err forever, asking me to choose, I would humbly take his left and say, Father, give, for the pure truth is for you alone. Archaeological readings of the landscape enrich the experience of inhabiting or visiting a place. Holtorf asserted, Those readings may well be based on science, but even non scientific research contributes to enriching our landscapes. The question for opponents of folk archaeology is whether such enrichment is delusional, participatory, public, or community. Archaeology offers guided engagement. Topic: In history. In the mid-2nd century, those exposed by Lucian's sarcastic essay, Alexander the False Prophet, prepared an archaeological find in Chalcedon to prepare a public for the supposed oracle they planned to establish at Abenotychus in Paphlagonia Pierce, 2001. I and the Temple of Apollo, which is the most ancient in Chalcedon, they buried bronze tablets which said that very soon Asclepius, with his father Apollo, would move to Pontus and take up his residence at Abenotychus. The opportune discovery of these tablets caused this story to spread quickly to all Bithynia and Pontus, and to Abenotychus sooner than anywhere else. At Glastonbury Abbey in 1291, at a time when King Edward I desired to emphasize his Englishness, a fortunate discovery was made, the coffin of King Arthur, unmistakably identified with an inscribed plaque. Arthur was reinterred at Glastonbury in a magnificent ceremonial attended by the king and queen. Topic. Examples Topic. Nationalistic pseudoarchaeology The assertion that the mound builders were a long-vanished non-Native American people thought to have come from Europe, the Middle East, or Africa. The Kensington Runestone of Minnesota held to prove Nordic Viking primacy in discovery of the Americas. Nazi archaeology, the Thule Society, and expeditions sent by the Ainabe to research the existence of a mythical Aryan race. 
The Black Egyptian Hypothesis, a hypothesis rooted within Afrocentric thought, alleging that ancient Egypt was a predominantly black civilization. The Bosnian Pyramids Project, which has projected that several hills in Visoko, Bosnia are ancient pyramids. The theory by British Israelists that the Hill of Tara in Ireland contained the Ark of the Covenant. They excavated the hill in an attempt to prove the Irish were part of the lost tribes of Israel. Piltdown Man Neolithic hyperdiffusion from Egypt being responsible for influencing most of the major ancient civilizations of the world in Asia, the Middle East, Europe, and particularly the ancient Native Americans. This includes Olmec alternative origin speculations. Jovan I. Deretic's serbocentric claims in the ancient history of the Old World. Romanian protochronism also uses pseudo-archaeological interpretations. For more pieces of information, see the Tartaria tablets, the Rahonk Codex's Daco Romanian hypothesis, or the Sinaia lead plates. Slav Macedonian nationalists view that ancient Macedonians were people unrelated to Greeks and that contemporary Slav Macedonians are their cultural, historical and linguistic descendants. <laughs> Religiously motivated pseudo-archaeology Repeated claims of the discovery of Noah's Ark on Mount Ararat or neighboring mountain ranges Use of questionable artifacts such as the Grave Creek Stone, the Los Lunas Decalogue Stone and the Michigan Relics represent proof of the presence of a pre-Columbian Semitic culture in America. New Age assertions about Atlantis, Lemuria, and ancient root races derived from the writings of authors such as 19th-century theosophist and occultist Helena Blavatsky. Mayanism and the 2012 Phenomenon Denial of scientific dating techniques in favor of a young Earth age. Topic: <inaudible> General pseudoarchaeology. Archaeological interest of Pedra da Gorvia. The work of 19th and early 20th century authors such as Ignatius Donnelly, Augustus Le Plongon, James Churchward, and Arthur Poznanski. The work of contemporary authors such as Eric von Daniken, Barry Fell, Zecharia Sitchin, Robert Bauville, Frank Joseph, Graham Hancock, Colin Wilson, Michael Kremo, Emanuel Velikovsky, and David Hatcher Childress. Lost continents such as Atlantis, Mu, Kamari Kandam, or Lemuria, which are all contested by mainstream archaeologists and historians as lacking critical physical evidence and general historical credibility. The ancient astronaut theory regarding Mayan ruler Pakal II Speculation regarding pre-Columbian contact between Egypt and the Maya Speculation by paranormal researchers that an abnormal human skull promoted as the Starchild skull was the product of extraterrestrial human breeding or extraterrestrial genetic engineering, despite DNA evidence proving that the skull was that of an anatomically modern human infant, most likely suffering from hydrocephalus. <laughs> Notable pseudo-archaeological works Chariots of the Gods Fingerprints of the Gods from Atlantis to the Sphinx. Topic: <inaudible> Legitimate archaeological sites often subject to pseudo-archaeological speculation. Puma Punku, Stonehenge, the Great Pyramid of Giza, the Sphinx, Etruscan inscriptions, Easter Island. Teotihuacan Palenque Chichen Itza Gobekli Tipa Zoritskara aka Armenian Stonehenge The Nazca Lines The Stone Spheres of Costa Rica The Chinese Pyramids The Megalithic Temples of Malta Nan Madol The Yonaguni Monument Topic. Academic archaeological responses 
Pseudo-archaeological theories have come to be heavily criticized by academic and professional archaeologists. Prominent academic archaeologist Colin Renfrew stated his opinion that it was appalling that pseudo-archaeologists treated archaeological evidence in such a frivolous and self-serving way, something he believed trivialized the serious matter of the study of human origins. Academics like John R. Cole, Garrett G. Fagan and Kenneth L. Fader have argued that pseudo-archaeological interpretations of the past were based upon sensationalism, self-contradiction, fallacious logic, manufactured or misinterpreted evidence, quotes taken out of context and incorrect information. Fagan and Fader characterized such interpretations of the past as being anti-reason and anti-science, with some being hyper-nationalistic, racist and hateful. In turn, many pseudo-archaeologists have dismissed academics as being close-minded and not willing to consider theories other than their own. Many academic archaeologists have argued that the spread of alternative archaeological theories is a threat to the general public's understanding of the past. Fagan was particularly scathing of television shows that presented pseudo-archaeological theories to the general public, believing that they did so because of the difficulties in making academic archaeological ideas comprehensible and interesting to the average viewer. Renfrew however believed that those television executives commissioning these documentaries knew that they were erroneous, and that they had allowed them to be made and broadcast simply in the hope of short-term financial gain. Fagan and Fader believed that it was not possible for academic archaeologists to successfully engage with pseudo-archaeologists, remarking that, You cannot reason with unreason. Speaking from their own experiences, they thought that attempted dialogues just became, slanging matches in which the expertise and motives of the critic become the main focus of attention. Fagan has maintained this idea elsewhere, remarking that arguing with supporters of pseudo-archaeological theories was pointless because they denied logic. He noted that they included those who openly admitted to not having read a word written by a trained Egyptologist, but who at the same time were pronouncing how academic Egyptology was all wrong, even sinister. Topic conferences and anthologies At the 1986 meeting of the Society for American Archaeology, its organizers, Kenneth Fader, Luann Hudson and Francis Harold decided to hold a symposium to examine pseudo-archaeological beliefs from a variety of academic standpoints, including archaeology, physical anthropology, sociology, history and psychology. From this symposium, an anthology was produced, entitled Cult Archaeology and Creationism, Understanding Pseudo-Archaeological Beliefs About the Past 1987. At the 2002 annual meeting of the Archaeological Institute of America, a workshop was held on the topic of pseudo-archaeology. It subsequently led to the publication of an academic anthology, Archaeological Fantasies, How Pseudo-Archaeology Misinterprets the Past and Misleads the Public, 2006, which was edited by Garrett G. Fagan. On 23 and 24 April 2009, the American Schools of Oriental Research and the Duke University Center for Jewish Studies, along with the Duke Department of Religion, the Duke Graduate Program in Religion, the Trinity College of Arts and Sciences Committee on Faculty Research, and the John Hope Franklin Humanities Institute, sponsored a conference entitled Archaeology, Politics, and the Media, which addressed the abuse of archaeology in the Holy Land for political, religious, and ideological purposes. Emphasis was placed on the media's reporting of sensational and politically motivated archaeological claims and the Academy's responsibility in responding to it. Topic. Inclusive attitudes Academic archaeologist Cornelius Holtorf believed however that critics of alternative archaeologies like Fagan were opinionated and patronizing towards alternative theories, and that purporting their views in such a manner was damaging to the public's perception of archaeologists. Holtorf highlighted that there were similarities between academic and alternative archaeological interpretations, with the former taking some influence from the latter. As evidence, he highlighted archaeoastronomy, which was once seen as a core component of fringe archaeological interpretations before being adopted by mainstream academics. 
He also noted that certain archaeological scholars, like William Stukeley (1687–1765), Margaret Murray (1863–1963), and Maria Gimbutas (1921–1994), were seen as significant figures to both academic and alternative archaeologists. He came to the conclusion that a constructive dialogue should be opened up between academic and alternative archaeologists. Fagan and Fader have responded to Holtorf's views in detail, asserting that such a dialogue is no more possible than is one between evolutionary biologists and creationists or between astronomers and astrologers. One approach is scientific, the other is anti scientific. In the early 1980s, Kenneth Fader conducted a survey of his archaeology students. On the 50 question survey, 10 questions had to do with archaeology and/or pseudoscience. Some of the claims were more rational, the world is 5 billion years old, and human beings came about through evolution. However, questions also included issues such as, King Tut's tomb actually killed people upon discovery, and there is solid evidence for the existence of Atlantis. As it turned out, some of the students Fader was teaching put some stake in the pseudoscience claims. 12% actually believed people on Howard Carter's expedition were killed by an ancient Egyptian curse. <laughs> See also